8 gigabytes of RAM is enough for most developers. Not in 2024. Yeah, if you code in Notepad, good luck multitasking. You ever heard of containers? Stuck in 2007 much? Apple sheep. Was I wrong about 8 gigabytes being enough? I put the 8 gigabyte MacBook Airs and MacBook Pros through all kinds of developer torture tests, but a good test in the lab is still not as good as the suffering that I could actually endure using a MacBook like this 8 gigabyte M3 MacBook Pro for a whole week. I was determined to see how far I could push it before hitting a wall, so I gave my M2 Max with 64 gigabytes of RAM for safekeeping to my wife and proceeded with the 8 gigabyte developer experience. Right from the beginning, I just plugged in a monitor. There's nothing else running except activity monitor. Ta-da! Day one started out with some nerves. Outside of testing, I haven't actually used a machine with only 8 gigabytes of RAM since 2007. Out of the 8 gigabytes, we've got 4.23 already used. What's using that uh, 4 gigabytes? It's macOS. macOS is anticipating certain things and it's doing some caching. App memory is only 1.77 gigabytes. Does this make me feel comfy and cozy looking at activity monitor and seeing my memory go poof? Not really. But the main question is, is it gonna hold up? That's what we're trying to test here. Day one focused on setting up the machine for development work involving the migration of essential software like Homebrew, Xcode, and .NET. And I do have to wonder how the rest of my week is gonna go considering some of the big things I have planned. Day two involved web development work. Things were pretty smooth until I had a video meeting. Things still worked pretty smoothly, but my CPUs got past the 90 degree mark and the body was pretty warm to the touch. The fans kicked up at this point and didn't stop until well they haven't stopped yet actually it's now 6 p.m and they're still running at 2500 rpm the cpu is now around 80 degrees overall things are going okay and if i didn't have to constantly peek at the temperatures and the fan because i want to tell you what, what they are i probably wouldn't even notice because the fan is nearly silent even though it's at 2500 RPM. Despite the thermal challenges, the MacBook continues to perform smoothly, indicating a well-managed thermal system. The only indication the fan was on was the TG Pro icon in my menu bar. Today I'm working on a Blazor app. Day three brought some challenges with .NET development. I needed .NET 6 for my Blazor app, but I had .NET 7 installed. Yes, I'm a little behind, okay? .NET 6, June 13, 23, ARM64 for Mac OS. Let's grab this one. When I download and install the SDK for .NET 6, it installs just fine, but then I still have .NET 7. So I need to go here to .NET on GitHub and figure out how to uninstall .NET. Eventually, I got the app running but it wasn't without some frustration i could have easily done this in visual studio but i would need a virtual machine for that and we're not quite there yet friends that net version six <laughs> it worked all right this app actually works that's pretty exciting the chart is rendering and everything pinging the api and getting their data back i like it i'm able to navigate everything fine i'm not seeing any kind of environmental freezes delays the only delay is this delay right here. I will be loading up this solution in Visual Studio with Parallels. Uh, that's on my list. I'm gonna check that out too. For now, everything is smooth sailing. At this point, I'm kind of expecting bad things to happen, but they're just not. Day four was a real test. I tried running a Windows virtual machine in Parallels and it was a struggle. The eight gigabytes of RAM was simply not enough here. Now let's see if Visual Studio runs my project. Initially configured for a machine with more RAM, which I copied over to this laptop, the Windows Virtual Machine demanded a reset. Performance issues became apparent with lag and slow response times during development tasks in the virtualized windows. Just moving around feels like a little bit of a drag. It feels like somebody's in pain and it's probably both of us. So Windows is running pretty terribly. It's slow and laggy, but the outside, the host is still running okay. There is an initial delay when I switch from the virtual machine to Chrome, for example, there is an initial little jerk. It seems like it does a little context switch and then everything is smooth here. I'm changing the memory to six gigabytes on the virtual machine. Let's see what happens. It says it's not recommended. Oh, 
My Mac configuration doesn't allow running virtual machines with such amount of memory. Start anyway. Pretty scary message. Hey look, my machine is running. Well, Windows is running a little bit better. Not much better though. We're using 4.8 gigabytes of swap on the host. And that's not good for the host or for the SSD. And the SSD is what a lot of people are worried about. Not the performance of the machine necessarily because, well, it's not bad. And I might just get another spanking in the comments for this, but we don't know how long the SSD is going to run for. We don't know that on a brand new machine that has 64 gigabytes and we don't know that on a machine that has 8 gigabytes. It might run you for 10 years with constant swap being used. Yeah, it's not good for the SSD. It's common sense, sure, but is it within the lifetime of the machine? And if that's the case, then who cares? In general, this is a more demanding task than Docker simply because of memory allocation to the virtual machine. I've run Docker in my tests on a different machine, MacBook Air, just running Docker by itself already ate up a few gigabytes. Check out my MacBook Air review for that. I think I gave this thing a fair chance and it's been a struggle for the last like couple hours I've been working on this thing. It's just getting slower and slower and slower. Let me see where we're at here. So on the whole system, we're up to five gigabytes of swap, 7.2 gigabytes of memory used. This is a non-starter. On day five, I attempted some machine learning tasks. It's a new day. New chance. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. I couldn't last the whole week. Sorry, but I'm still doing enough tests for this thing. I'm using it quite a lot, getting the hang of it. And right now I'm downloading the Mistral LLM model because I'm going to do some machine learning tests on this. Specifically, I'm trying out MLX, which is Apple's new AI framework. This of course led to a complete failed test due to insufficient memory. I'm actually surprised the machine didn't even crash, but it felt like it was gonna. Wow. I'm running the convert script to convert the weights into uh, MLX format. And this is the first time I'm really hitting that red in the memory pressure. This might take a while. We've got 14 gigabytes of swap used. Holy moly. Oh wow. Here's the answer to that question. Are we able to run the smallest Mistral model, which is 7 billion parameters? And no, the answer is no. Terminating due to uncaught exception of type blah 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 blah, unable to allocate that many bytes. In other words, no, we're screwed. So I think that experiment was a failure. With memory intensive tasks like machine learning, you're gonna need a lot of RAM to be able to handle that and an eight gigabytes is simply not enough. At this point in the week, we're starting to get a sense of what kind of things we can do and what kind of things we can't do with this kind of machine. Day six focused on mobile development. A little caveat about this. If you're just doing Xcode, which I showed in my MacBook Air video, you should be okay for the most part. However, for this particular test on the M3 MacBook Pro, I did Xcode and Android. And let me tell you, Android development is a big enemy of RAM. Android emulator has taken up almost five gigabytes. I'm gonna shut that one down. If it lets me, come on, there. Jeez, come on. The system struggled. I actually experienced freezes and slow performance, making development difficult to say the least. I got stuck. I rebooted my machine. Even after reboot, nothing is happening. It's kind of stuck. All I did was open up Xcode and I'm just asking it to run a hello world in a simulator. That's all. And it's not complying at all. This is really disappointing. One last shot. Okay, it did start up the simulator finally, but that's just not acceptable at all. Oh, hi, there you are. Thanks, but no thanks. This day ended in disappointment with system freezes and unacceptable performance during basic tasks. And that really revealed this MacBook's limitations for doing cross-platform mobile development. All right, would I ever buy an eight gigabyte machine to use for myself? Heck no. Even back in 2007, I had 24 gigabytes in my desktop when I used to build my own machines before I truly understood the value of time. Do I think that Apple should stop selling the eight gigabyte laptop? No, I really don't. Well, Alex, you're being a hypocrite. Well, I think there are real people out there, including real developers that will be perfectly happy with an eight gigabyte machine. Now, should Apple charge $1,600 for a laptop with only eight gigabytes of RAM? Ah, there's the real question. And I think that's what most people are upset about. I may have a lot of laptops now, but for my first 10 years as a software developer, I refused to buy a laptop. Why buy a less powerful, less capable machine for more money? It just didn't make sense to me until I had to buy my first laptop for work travel. See, it's all about perspective. Value is subjective. Somebody might look at a PC laptop and only judge it by the specs, like 32 gigabytes. That's good. Look, Apple is charging more for 
8 gigabytes. Yes, Apple charges a lot for their laptops. An 8 gigabyte laptop that costs $1,600 might seem ridiculous when coming from a perspective of a value PC laptop where you can get 32 gigabyte machine for the same price. But if you examine just the Apple ecosystem, MacBook Airs are still selling like hotcakes, even the 8 gigabyte models. If we look at Apple's website, a 15 inch MacBook Air that's 8 gigabytes and 512 gigabyte SSD, same as the MacBook Pro M3 base model is $1,500. Now, if you take that and slap the word pro on it, give it a fan, better screen, better speakers, a card reader, all that for just $100 more, making it $1,600, which in my opinion is the best upgrade that Apple offers. And now people are upset and screaming that $1,600 is too much for a machine with eight gigabytes. Is it because of the word pro in it? Maybe, maybe they're right, but it doesn't matter to Apple. Not because they're heartless, but because it's a business and heart has nothing to do with it. Dell is now starting to do the same thing with their pricing too. See, in Apple's view, the perfect product price is where somebody will gripe just enough, but still buy. Those that gripe and don't buy aren't Apple's customers anyway. MacBook users will keep buying because they know what they're getting. Well, what are they getting, Alex? Well, I simply called it a premium laptop, which got me a lot of complaints, but I'm just a talking head on YouTube. It will be difficult to find a better overall package in the multimedia area, since there's no better combination of high quality workmanship, a great mini LED display, low emissions, you almost never hear the fans in everyday operation, excellent speakers, and an immense battery life. This is from a reputable review website called notebookcheck.net that mostly do PC reviews. Is it ideal that upgrade prices are so high? No. The software developers that buy Macs know that we will make good use of these machines for work and make that money back multiple times over? Yes. And still be able to sell our MacBooks for more than one third the price even after using them for several years? Yes. Look, I've made videos about selling my MacBooks, trading them in. I'll link to some of those down below. The bottom line is you can get a lot more for your MacBook once you sell it than you can get for a PC. And a lot of times we don't figure that into the pricing. What ends up happening is uh, a nice RGB Asus laptop like this one that costs over $2,000 is pretty much worthless or maybe I can get a hundred bucks for it after two years, but I can still probably get a thousand dollars for my M2 Max MacBook Pro. All right, I went on a little bit of a rant there. What about this M3 MacBook Pro with eight gigabytes of RAM? I can't tell you to go get it because I wouldn't get it myself. If you have the funds to get more RAM, get more RAM. If you have the funds to get more SSD, get more SSD. Max it out because you can't upgrade it. But maybe you don't need to. Evaluate your own needs and maybe eight gigabytes is enough for you. Now check out this video for more of those specific software developed tests with that base model M3 MacBook Pro right over here. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.